welcome to our Cactus Campus and all of you at Shea in the venue and in the chapel and all of you in the worship center. Welcome to Northridge. Good to be teaching from you from the great white north. So it's good to be up here. I was telling somebody yesterday, we probably need to welcome our fourth temporary multi-site for all of you over on Mission Beach. We're so happy for you and your 72 degree cool ocean breeze. That's so great. Enjoy that because it's 112 here, so it's coming for you. But it's great to be with you guys. Uh, we're continuing our series on the Summer on the Mount, this whole idea of the Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to pick up where Rustin left off last week. If you were here last week, Rustin talked about this idea of blessed are the poor in spirit. Remember, blessed are those that are spiritually bankrupt, that come to the party and realize, God, we need you. We can't do this on our own. And because of our spiritual bankruptcy, we're dependent upon you. And so he gave us that great definition of what does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means to be dependent upon, dependent upon something else. And we're dependent upon God for everything. So we're gonna kind of pick the ball up there and keep running with it. But before we do that, I gotta set the stage a little bit. Uh, so I'm gonna give you this illustration. Have you guys heard of Nick Walenda? Nick Walenda is a tightrope walker. I'd never heard of this guy until seven years ago. He decided that he was gonna walk a tightrope across the Grand Canyon. And so here's a picture of Nick crossing the Grand Canyon. You can see him right here. I love it. He's just jeans, T-shirt, and a gigantic pole. And away we go across the Grand Canyon walking this tightrope. Here's the overhead shot. I love this picture here because you can see, look, I mean, there's not much to that wire. And there's just imminent danger on the left and on the right. There's no net, no, no safety line, nothing. It was just him, a giant pole, and the wire as he walks across this tightrope. Imminent danger lurking on either side. And so guys, today we've got to walk a tightrope, a theological tightrope. And there's danger lurking on either side. And if we don't find ourselves in the center, we're going to be in real trouble. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna set up the stage and let you know, okay, on the, uh, we got one danger on the right, one danger on the left. And I'm gonna submit to you that every one of us has a tendency just in our flesh and our natural self to lean one way or the other. And some of us may be way over here and we're in real trouble. We're already off the wire and we're falling. Some of us may be a little closer to home, but we've got a tendency to lean right or left. And so here's what I need you to do. I just need you to identify, okay, which way is me? Which way do I tend to lean? I'm gonna set up the argument and describe somebody that's way over here. And maybe that's not you, but maybe you're a little closer to the middle, but you know you tend to lean that way or you tend to lean the other way. But I need you to identify which one's you because I'm gonna submit this. This is where Satan loves to work on God's church. He loves to take some sons and daughters of his and go, all right, let me just get you a little, stray a little way from home and now I've got you right where I want you. Now I can work. And we need to get back to center as we walk this tightrope because where Jesus is gonna take us, it's easy to run with one extreme or the other. And I think where he's calling us is right to the center. So here are your options. On this side, on the right side, I'm gonna say this. My right, your left. Uh, this is what we're gonna call the grace abusing side. Okay, these are grace abusers. These are ones that, that love to live life however they want to live it, uh, and they think, hey, God's going to forgive me, so what's the big deal? If they did, they'd tattoo 1 John 1, 9 on both forearms and just walk around and go, hey, he is faithful and just to forgive me of all unrighteousness, so I can go do whatever I want, and he's faithful, he's going to forgive me, and so they live life that way. We find ourselves, if you've ever been in this position, where you've got a moral decision, right or wrong. And you decide, okay, I'm gonna do the wrong thing and it's okay. I may even ask forgiveness before I do it because I know God will forgive me. And we begin to abuse God's grace. We begin to interpret the world around us based on culture instead of allowing God's truth to define culture for us and tell us what we ought to believe. We, we begin to compromise God's truth a little bit and we begin to waver to the right. And we begin to abuse God's grace. So for all of you that go, man, that's not me. I'm glad that's not me. Well, let's talk about the other side because I would say this side's potentially more dangerous and the enemy loves to lurk here just as much. We're gonna call the, the left side, my left, your right, this idea of legalism. Legalism, legalism, pharisaicalism. This is the idea that, that we live life by a bunch of rules, a bunch of do's and don'ts. And what happens is we begin to interpret our relationship with our heavenly father based on the rules that we've obeyed or not obeyed. And so everything becomes a bunch of rules, a checklist of do's and don'ts. And if you get really legalistic and very over on this side, you can become very self-righteous. 
These are the ones that love to look around. In fact, they scan the room at times and they go, man, I'm far more righteous than any of these. At our worst states in legalism, we find ourselves looking at God and going, God, look at all that I've done for you. Look how many Bible studies I went to this week. Look at how much I gave. Look at how much I served. God, you're pretty lucky to have me as part of your family. And with pride and arrogance, we tend to puff our chest out because we're so consumed by what we do and we think that's what makes us right. And I'm telling you right now, if you, if you tip left or you tip right, they're both dangerous. And somewhere in the middle is where Christ is calling us today. And so that's where we're gonna go. That's where we're gonna go. Let me pray for us and then we're gonna dive into our time in the word. God, we thank you for your book, for this truth that you've given us. God, what a precious gift it is. And so God, I pray this morning as we look at it, God, that we would not just learn truth for our heads, but God, we would apply this truth to our lives. It would change our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would do what only he can do. And God, you know, it's been my prayer, it will continue to be my prayer that for some of us, myself included, if there are things that we need to leave here this morning and grab onto your cross with all that we have, God, that we would do that that we would not leave here without doing business with you, acknowledging that we may have wandered from you a little bit, God, that you're calling us home this morning. And so God, I pray that we would walk this theological tightrope correctly. I pray that your word would speak to our hearts. I pray your spirit would do what only he can do. And we'll thank you in advance for it. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna pick it up in Matthew chapter five. We're gonna look at verses 17 through 20. Just four verses, and here, here's what they say right here. It says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches, others, and teaches others the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Then he says this in verse 20, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Man, so a lot going on here, guys. Let me unpack this for us a little bit. Let's go back to verse uh, 17 if you can. Here's what he starts off with. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Here's what we have going on. Jesus gathers his men, right? His 12 disciples. He takes them up on a hill and he begins to teach them. There was some murmuring, some conversation, some communication going on uh, that Jesus had come on the scene and was gonna change everything. Because you see, they'd lived with this old religious system, this list of rules, this list of do's and don'ts. In fact, the Pharisees and scribes had a list of over 615 rules in which to live by. It was a legalist paradise. Here's your checkbook. Walk through each day, don't eat this, you can't eat that, wash this many times. If you touch this, you gotta do this to be clean. I mean, it was just a list of rules. So Jesus shows up on the scene and he starts breaking these rules. He's healing people on the Sabbath. He's eating, he's, he's grinding up grain on the Sabbath. He doesn't wash his hands before he eats. He's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And all of a sudden the Pharisees are up in arms about all of this. Meanwhile, you got the grace abusers that are going, yeah, hey, this Jesus, out with the old rules. Let's abolish those old rules. This guy's all about, look, he's hanging out with us. This is awesome. And so there was this understanding, this undercurrent going on that perhaps Jesus was coming to abolish the law. He was gonna change everything. The age of grace was gonna begin and the old law was gonna be gone. And he says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them. Play Roma is the Greek word, this idea that he came to fill them up, to actually make complete the old law and the prophets. So how does he do that? Two ways. One, certainly prophetically, he fulfills all the prophecy, right? You can go back and look just around his birth alone. He's from the tribe of of Judah. He's from the line of David. He was born in Bethlehem. He came from Nazareth. Like so many things line up where Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies. Even outside of his death, you get to, he's healing the deaf. He's making the blind see. So many things pointing towards the Messiah. In fact, you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter three. It's page two of your Bible. God makes everything, he makes it perfect. And then Adam and Eve come on the scene and they screw up and they blow it. And from the very beginning, God makes a promise 
about the future Messiah. So from page three until all the way through, everything's pointing towards Christ. Christ is gonna be the fulfillment of everything. And so Jesus shows up on the scene and goes, hey, don't think any of that stuff, that old stuff is outdated. I've not come to fulfill all of it prophetically, but he also fulfills it morally. Have you thought about that? The only person to ever breathe air on this planet and fulfill the law of God perfectly was Jesus Christ. He lived it perfectly. The Pharisees were good at following the rules, but their hearts were wicked. That's what Rustin talked about last week, right? God cares more about our heart than our actions. So on the outside, they look like whitewashed tombs, but on the inside, they're full of dead men's bones, right? They, they were wrong on the inside. And so Jesus cares about the heart. He's trying to get to the heart of everything. That's why he's gonna go on to say, you have heard it said, do not murder. Okay, fair, that's a good rule. I could probably not murder anyone just in my own will and discipline. That's probably within Kevin's scope of ability. But Jesus says, I say to you, do not even get angry at your brother. Don't even let a a part of this idea because anger leads to murder. Well, guys, I can't drive my kid to work on the 101 without getting angry, right? I mean, I've already failed. I say to you, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. Okay, I can be faithful to my wife. I can do that in my flesh, I can do that. But I say to you, do not even look at a woman lustfully. Oh man, good luck going to your summer vacation this year. It's just, it's a challenge. So Jesus takes the letter of the law and goes, here's the letter of the law, but let me give you the heart behind it and let me fulfill it perfectly. Let me live it out perfectly and set an example for you. Don't think I've come to abolish it. You grace abusers that might go, oh, the word of God's outdated. It's not that big of a deal. That was culturally relevant then, but now it's a much different situation. No, 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 no. Don't think any of it is no longer applicable to today. Jesus didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. And Christ gave us the perfect example. He'd go on to say this in verse 18. He says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, Not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Not a dot. Some of your Bibles might say a jot or a tittle. The smallest little inflection in the Hebrew alphabet, Hebrew letter, changed on a word that would change the entire word. A little tiny little, it's like an apostrophe at the bottom of a letter. Not one bit of that is gonna go away until all is accomplished. Jesus is lifting up the scriptures right here and saying, look, this thing, this book, this this book we call the Bible, man, this is significant. This is truth. So much so that he would say, none of it's gonna go away. Not one word of this book is gonna fail to come to completion until everything is accomplished. So my legalist friends are going, yeah, preach it. All about the word of God. here's, Here's our problem on the legalist side of things. If we read the word of God, as a bunch of rules, of a bunch of do's and don'ts. I think Satan wins. Satan's got us, got us working out our salvation for ourselves and he's got us trying to justify ourselves by what we do. And so we make our little checklist, do this, do this, do this. You don't do that, you don't do that. And we begin to see it as a bunch of rules that we have to live by and Satan's going perfect. Keep trying and figuring that out because if you keep doing that and trying to save yourself, you're not dependent upon my son, Jesus. And that's right where he wants us. Now, the grace abusers on the other side, we tend to look at the word of God and go, ah, archaic, old. We, you hear this argument all the time when it comes to maybe the most hot button issue of our culture right now, sexuality, right? Well, the, Bible, the Bible's got some archaic ways of thinking in regards to that. Culture clearly would say something different. And so we begin to interpret the word of God through culture instead of letting the word of God interpret how we view the world around us. And we begin to compromise truth because we think, ah, it's outdated, it's no big deal. That was just the Apostle Paul's thinking. That was Old Testament stuff. And we begin to change how we view the world based on what God's word says because the culture defines it. Guys, don't be mistaken. Not one word of this book is gonna go away until all is accomplished. And so here's my hope. Here's been my prayer. You know what I love about the fact that we're reading the Bible this this summer, the Immerse Bible? How many of you guys are, are still doing that? You guys doing all right? Here's my challenge. If you haven't started, start. 
If you're behind, keep going. God doesn't care if you stick to the eight week timeline that they have in the back of the book. I know some of you type A's are like, I gotta get my 15 pages in every day, every second. Take a breath. It's God's word. It's meant to breathe life into us. It's godly instruction from a loving father. It's not a list of rules, not a bunch of do's and don'ts, and it's not archaic and not to be, not to be taken seriously. It is a precious gift given to us by our heavenly father. I would submit to you this, short of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, there is no greater gift God has given his creation than this book. Are we pouring over it? Are we allowing God's word to impact our life? Do we see it as godly instruction from our heavenly father? You see, if you read it as a bunch of rules and God's kind of this stern dictator up there waiting for you to fail, looking down at you, then Satan wins. You're misreading the word of God. And if you think it's just, ah, that's, that's not that big of a deal, you may bring it to church, then throw it in your car and not scoop it up until next Sunday when you gotta walk back in here. Man, we're not taking advantage of this precious gift. Jesus says not one dot, not one iota will, will come, not come to pass until all is accomplished. There is no greater truth given to us in our world today than this book. And do we love it? We spend time in it. Wherever you're at in the Immerse study, just keep going. Keep plowing through. Pour over scripture. Study God's word. Pick up, a, if you need to get a Bible, we have them in the bookstore, we've got them ever. Get a Bible. Get your own Bible and start pouring through it. Make some notes, highlight some things. Love the word of God because it's all gonna come to pass and nothing's gonna go away until all is accomplished. Now let's get back to our tightrope here because it gets very interesting here in verse 19. Therefore, interesting, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, so think of the lowest commandment you can think of. I don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, maybe for you it's lying. I think that's a big deal, but maybe it's lying. Maybe it's honoring your parents. Whatever the lowest one is for you, let's, let's say you relax one of the least of these commandments and you teach others to do the same. You will be called least, interesting word here, in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven. So grace abusers love this verse, right? Basically what Jesus is saying here is saying, look, I don't have to obey the commandments. I can teach others not to obey and I'm still in the kingdom of heaven. I may be least, but I'm still in. And so we take this verse and we run with it and we start to think, yes, this is awesome. I can live my life however I want. God doesn't care. Wait a minute, no, 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 God cares. God cares a lot. Some of you guys in your immersed reading this week, you read 2 Corinthians 5.10. You guys know that one? Write it down, look it up. We will all kneel before the judgment seat of God and give an account for both the righteous and the wicked things that we have done. You don't think God cares? God's gonna, God's gonna hold an account someday. 1 Corinthians 3, and I'd love to get into this with you. 1 Corinthians 3 talks about the idea of, look, everything you've done on this earth, good and bad, will be tested with fire. What that looks like, I don't know, but God's gonna test it with fire. And anything that's left, anything that survives this fire, you're given as a reward to take with you into eternity. What that looks like, I don't know, but it's gonna be awesome. There will be some of us, and here, here's my fear, there'll be some of us on the grace abusing side that find ourselves kneeling before the throne of God and God does not say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. But as the apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, you escape though as one escaping through the fire. And you may be in the kingdom of heaven, but you're gonna realize what you spent your entire life pursuing here did not matter one bit when it comes to your eternity later on. Because we chased the wrong thing. We abused God's grace. Sure you're in, but you've abused God's grace. So at some point you gotta, you gotta wrestle with this a little bit. Now he says this, for those of you legalists, this is where we get excited. But I say to you, give me a, give me a click, but whoever does them, these commandments, and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's what we all want, right? We all wanna kneel before the throne of God and have him go, well done, good and faithful servant, come enter my rest. That's what we long for. This is where obedience comes in. This is where holiness comes in. Any of you on the grace abusing side, don't think for a second that God doesn't call us to be holy. God doesn't call us to be set apart. In just a second in, in chapter five or chapter six, he's gonna say, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. There's a call to holiness for God's people, for God's children. But some of us on the legalist side, we take it a little bit too far and we begin to look around and we say, I am holy because of what I do. No, we are holy. We are righteous because of what Christ did and Christ alone. 
Our obedience, that's, that's, that's awesome. But my fear is there's some of us that are obeying God's law or obeying God's rules with a corrupt heart and God's not honored in that because that's what the Pharisees did. Super obedient, terrible hearts. So the question to ask yourself is when you pull out your checklist, some of you on this side of the camp, and you begin to look at your life and you look at the round of the world around you and you don't do what the world does and you do things that set you apart from the world, that's awesome. Why are you doing it? Do we do it because we're madly in love with our heavenly father and we can't help but please him? Or has Satan won a victory like he has in my life at times where he goes, Kevin, God's not gonna love you if you do that. God's gonna be displeased and disappointed in you if you don't do that. And so all of a sudden, my relationship with the Father becomes completely contingent upon my life and, my, and how I live. Instead of living in his love and his grace and saying, God, I'm, I, I am poor in spirit. I bring nothing to this party but my sinful self. And you love me because you choose to. And because I'm your child, you love me. Independent of what I do or don't do. Do we get that? You see, to, to not get that, I feel like we fall into that camp. You remember Jesus' statement? When he said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because there was, a, there was an understanding, there were, the Pharisees were putting these heavy burdens on people. And people were showing up and they were just overwhelmed by all the rules and stuff we've got to do. And guys, sometimes that's the way Christianity can feel. I've got to, and I can't, and I've got to stop, and I need to change. And, uh, and we just get this. And maybe what God's saying to us, what he's saying to his men here is, would you just stop? Live out what you feel convicted by, but would you stop trying to do it in your own flesh and your own spirit? And would you surrender to my Holy Spirit and let me do what only I can do? And let's see what happens. I'll give you this example. Um, because I love you guys, I let this play itself out, even though it was 108 outside. Uh, my four-year-old daughter, McKinley. Awesome, love her, she's great. Uh, we went to the store the other day I got the stuff, loaded in the groceries, put them in the car. Dad, I can buckle myself. Have you ever tried to buckle a kid in a car seat? It's not easy. She can do it herself. So she sat there in the 105 degree heat with her dad sweating outside. Three and a half minutes which doesn't seem like a long time. I get it because it's air conditioned in these buildings. It's great. 105 outside, groceries melting in the car. Three and a half minutes is a long time, but I let her go for this example. Finally, after three and a half minutes, she's just dripping with sweat. I'm dripping with sweat. Everyone's getting ready to call the police because I'm a negligent father. I don't know what's going on. She finally looks at me and goes, Dad, I can't do it. I need your help. Okay, click, click, air conditioning's on. Away we go. Eight seconds later. Here's why I tell you that. Whether you're a grace abuser or a legalist, here's what we tend to do. We kind of look at our life. We look at our, okay, I, I gotta fix all this stuff. And like a three and a half, four-year-old little girl trying to buckle herself in the car seat, we try and fix our lives. Try and clean up all the stuff that we've got going on. We try and do or don't do. We try and, we try and chase all these things. And God's up there going, okay, Kevin, whenever you're done, whenever you're finished trying, Whenever you're finished trying to get this done, let me step in and do what only I can do because that's the way it was always meant to be anyway. So Jesus says, look, 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 it's not about obedience for the sake of obedience getting into the kingdom of heaven. You're in because of what I did, because of who Jesus Christ is and Christ alone. Maybe there's some of us this morning that just need to go, oh, we need to lay some feet at the, things, at the feet of the cross, grab onto Jesus with all we have because this is where he goes next in verse 20. For I tell you, now don't legalists, don't go nuts on me here. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter. Uh-oh, we got a word change here. Now this seems to be salvific to me. Whoever, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So we can obey or not obey and we're in the kingdom of heaven. But in order to get in, we have to have righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now to a bunch of little Jewish fishermen, who Jesus is talking to, some tax collectors, he would say this and they would look at each other and go, are you, are you kidding me? We can't do that. We can't do that. 
So there's one of two things going on here. Either Jesus is saying, look, the Pharisees do a thousand things right. I need you to do a thousand and one. You do a thousand and one and you're in. And we can begin to work and work and work and work and try to, I don't think that's right. I think that's the way Satan might want us to take it. I think what Jesus is saying here is he's setting the bar so high, so impossibly high that his men would lean in and go, Jesus, hey, hey, we can't do that. We can't exceed their righteousness. We're blue collar fishermen. There's too, uh, we're too far gone. We can't do that. And Jesus would lean in, put his arms around his guys and go, guys, I know you can't, but I can. And only through me is this possible. And his guys would take a deep breath and go, oh man, this is awesome. Because this air of grace is coming in. This forgiveness of Jesus Christ is entering the world. And all of a sudden, it's not, do, it's not outdo the religious. It's surrender everything to me and grab onto me with all you've got. Why? Because we need Jesus for everything. We need Jesus for everything. And until we get that, until we realize that, we're either abusing God's grace, trying to chase other things, we'll talk about that in a second, or we're trying to save ourselves through our works and our actions, and we're not dependent upon Christ. And that's right where the enemy wants us, in either one of those two camps. And so where Christ is calling us is back to a dependency, an utter and complete dependency upon him. Are we all in on Jesus? Let me give you this illustration. I was at the beach, so... My son plays baseball. We went to a baseball tournament over in California four weeks ago. In between baseball games, we went to Huntington Beach. Great beach. My two sons are out there being knuckleheads out in the ocean, having a great time, splashing, playing. As a father, it was like, oh, look, my boys love each other. This is great. It was awesome. Just to the left of me is about an 18-month-old little girl. And she is playing in the sand and she is flopping around in the sand like a baby harbor seal trying to find its mother. Just throwing sand up in the air and just from head to toe covered in sand. So I watched this go on for a little bit and all of a sudden about a half hour goes by and the parents begin to pack up. They're folding up their towels, taking down their umbrella and the mom comes over and tells the little girl, hey, we're gonna go rinse off. So this little girl reaches up and just grabs her mom's pinky finger with her hand. And they begin to walk towards the ocean. And they get a little bit closer, and a little girl lets go of her pinky finger, and now she grabs mom's whole hand, and they're hand in hand. And they get a little bit closer, and this little girl reaches up and grabs onto her mom's forearm. And where it goes next, I tried to take a picture. I wanted to get a picture of this to show you guys. Uh, there's certain registries a 40-year-old pastor doesn't want to end up on for taking pictures of 18-month-old girls at the beach. So I decided not to do that. But just go with me on this. As she's holding her mom's hand, she reaches up with her other hand, and with both arms, she's now clenched onto her mom's forearm as they get a little bit closer to the water. And they get a little bit closer, and a little bit closer. And then this girl does something with core strength I only long to have someday. She lifts her entire body up and wraps her legs around her mom's upper arm bicep. And like a baby koala bear, she is just on this mom's arm. And the mom's just doing this with this little girl dangling off of here. And this girl is squeezing with all she's got because you can see the mom's hand. It turns really white and then it turns like a pinkish purple color because this little girl is squeezing so tightly onto her mom's arm with all that she's got. And she begins to cry and cry out and she's squeezing and she's squeezing because somewhere in her 18 month old mind, all she can think of is, A, that water is cold, B, it's dangerous. I'm gonna hold on to the only thing I know to be stable in my life in this moment right now and that is my mom with all that I've got because she's my only hope. And so with everything this little girl has, with every ounce of energy she's got, she is clinging to her mother's arm. So here's the question. When was the last time we clung to the cross of Christ that way with all that we've got. Both arms, both legs, we are all in on Jesus and we realize and we surrender everything and say, God, I can't do what you need me to do. I can't fix myself. I can't be more righteous than the Pharisees or the scribes. I need you for everything. And we surrender everything to the, to the cross of Christ and we grab onto Jesus with both arms and we just hold on for all we've got. You see, I think that's where Christ is calling us. I think that's where he wants us. I think that's this tightrope that we're walking is this utter and complete dependence upon Jesus Christ. Because to think anything other is to have, have Satan in our ears saying, exactly, it's not about Jesus, it's about you. 
It's about you. You can, you can do this on your own. And all of a sudden we begin chasing things that he wants us to chase and we're not surrendering everything to the cross of Christ. Are we clinging to Jesus with all we've got? Let me give you the danger of both sides, which we tend to lean. If you're a grace abuser, at least for me in my life, this is what it ends up doing. I, I, I see something that the world offers that Satan casts out in front of me as bait and I begin to chase it and pursue it. Oh, if I had that, I'd be satisfied. If I had that, that's gonna fulfill all that I want. And so I chase it and I chase it and I chase it. And then I finally get it. And I got it in my hands and then I realized it's just hollow ash and it evaporates into nothing. And I realized that wasn't it. And so because I've got the Holy Spirit living inside me as a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit begins to convict and convict and convict. And I find myself in a place that I never wanted to be, just convicted by the Holy Spirit, realizing, God, I should have never end up here. I know too much. I lo- you love me too much. How did I end up here? And much like the prodigal son, if you remember Jamie's sermon about a month ago, the prodigal son that wanders eating the pig slop, you find yourself at rock bottom going, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? Why don't I return back to my heavenly father? And if you know that story, you run back to God and God embraces you and restores you and God's grace is there for you. And man, maybe there's some of us If you were to be honest, and this is what I've been praying for all of us, that the Holy Spirit would convict our soul a little bit, would grab onto us. And if we've been chasing something, pursuing something, and we know, and you know, because I know, when when I'm doing it, when I'm living in it, I know I'm living in it. And it's that that thing in your your spirit that you just go, man, I I, I don't wanna talk about it. I don't wanna think about it. Well, we're gonna talk about it and think about it right now. Whatever that is, whatever you've been chasing or pursuing, maybe this morning what God's calling you to do is just say, hey, would you stop for a second? Would you turn from that just for a second? Would you let it go? Not in your flesh, not in your will, not in your obedience, not in in your, I'm gonna do this, but just in an absolute surrender and say, God, I can't, I can't fix that. I can't. I need you for everything. And your father will lean in and say, finally, finally you get it. Let me scoop you up and let's deal with what we need to deal with through my power and through my spirit. Maybe that's what you need to hear this morning. Let that go. Wrap both arms around the cross of Christ and hold on with all that you've got. We speak to us legalists because this is where I tend to live most of the time. We find ourselves listing our list of rules. I can't create my own little mental checklist of morality. Here's the things I need to do. Here's the things I will never do. And as long as I can check all of those boxes, I feel pretty good about myself. Me and God are great. But the problem is three weeks, three months, three hours, three days go by and all of a sudden I fail to live up to my own moral list. And at least for me, what happens is I fail, I fall morally and Satan just takes his little thumb of oppression and presses it on me and guilt and shame wells up in me like you wouldn't believe. So much so that I can't even look at my father. And I just sit here and I go, God, I'm such a failure. I am worthless. And I begin to believe all these things about myself that are not biblically true, but I feel them in my soul because I broke my own rules that I set up that God told me to live by. And because I broke them, therefore God can't love me. And so therefore I'm an unloved child of God. And I live in that state for a period of time until I finally pick up the word of God and begin to read Proverbs and I begin to read Romans. And I begin to read some of these promises of God and go, God, you love me. I'm your child, I'm the apple of your eye. And then I realized, God, I'm sorry that I made it about me. I'm sorry I made it about my obedience. I'm sorry I made it about my own self-righteous pride. And I gotta let my own list of morality go. I'm not saying that I stop doing any of that stuff. I'm not saying compromise what God's convicting you and calling you to as a believer in Jesus Christ. But what I'm saying is if you're living that, thinking this is what makes God love you, then Satan has won. Because God loves you because he chooses to, period. And until we get there, we try and save ourselves and Satan goes, good, keep exhausting yourself over here. Just don't grab onto Jesus. Just don't pay attention to Christ because that's when real work gets done. And instead of just changing outward behavior, which we can do in our flesh and legalists, we're great at at great behavior, but we never deal with our heart. That's right where Satan wants us. All of a sudden, if you lay that down and you come back to the cross of Christ and say, Jesus, I need you for everything. I'm sorry I made it about myself. And you lay that down and you grab onto the cross of Christ with both arms. And all of a sudden, God begins to change your heart. 
man, now we're doing some real work. Now the Holy Spirit's doing some real work. And guess what, guys? Here's the beauty. In either scenario, you surrender everything to the cross of Christ and God wipes out addictions or sins or whatever it is, or he changes your moral understanding and you begin to live your life differently because your heart changes. You know who gets all the glory in that? It's not you. It's your father. It's almost like that's the way he intended it. So we walk around and you don't go, oh, look at me, look at how good I am. You walk around poverty of spirit, poor in spirit and realizing I needed Jesus for everything and he gave me everything. And I'm a different person right now. I'm a different husband, different wife, a different father, a different mother, a different coworker. I'm, I'm changed from the inside out because of what God did in my life. All praise to God. And we don't become self-righteous. We don't become pharisaical. We don't become legalistic and we stop abusing God's grace and God goes, perfect, you're right in the middle, right where I wanted you to be. Do we get that? Are we living that out? So here's my hope, here's my prayer, especially as we get ready to go to communion in just a little bit, that God would begin to do a work on our heart. And for some of us, we would realize there's certain things that you might need to leave at the feet of the cross this morning. Maybe it's sin you're chasing, maybe it's your own self-righteous pride and arrogance, but you would leave it there and you'd grab onto the cross of Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you for everything and watch what God does. Just wait and see what God does because that's right where he wants all of us. So my hope would be as you take communion this morning, maybe you take it a little bit differently. Maybe you spend some time with your father and you just stop and think, all right, God, what is it I need to surrender to you? But then we would celebrate celebrate the fact that we don't have to exceed this Pharisee's righteousness in our flesh, but that we can find everything we need in Christ. And he meets us in the midst of that. You read it this week, right? Second Corinthians five, God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. All right, we are made right because of Christ's sacrifice. Let me end on this. If this is all news to you, if you're out there and you're going, man, what is this guy talking about? What, why is he so big on Jesus? Here's what you need to understand. This is what I came to realize when I was 14 years old. I'm screwed up. I'm a mess. You can call it whatever you want. Mistakes, bad decisions, poor timing. The Bible calls it sin. And because I'm a sinner, because I'm broken, because I'm not all that I need to be for Jesus, I need someone to die for me and, and save me. And so that's what Christ did. He found himself in a garden at the end of his life with a choice to make, to go be with the Father or to give his life for all of us. And he chose to give his life for all that placed their faith in him. And so there he is, dying on the cross so that I could be forgiven. And if you've never experienced what it means to be forgiven by the God of eternity, if you've never experienced the grace of God, and you want to experience that for the very first time, we would love to talk to you. I will be up front here. Your campus pastors will be up front wherever you're at. If you're online, shoot me an email, kuel at scottstillbible.com. I would love to interact with any and all of you because it's too important for us to live life trying to do it on our own or chasing the wrong things. At some point, we gotta surrender everything to Christ. And so if that's you, I'd encourage you to do that this morning. I'm gonna pray for us. We're gonna to go to the communion table and we're gonna to go to the communion table maybe a little bit differently than we have in the past. Maybe we need to lay some things down at his feet. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you that I don't have to clean myself up. And God, I confess to you all the times that I've tried. God, you know how many times I've tried and I've failed and yet you've still been gracious to me and for that I am so grateful. God, I pray for those things that I'm even struggling with now, God, that I would lay them at the feet of your cross in this moment, that I would grab onto you with all that I have, that I would cling to you with every fiber of my being. God, I pray the same for these individuals here and on our other venues and campuses, God, that we would surrender everything to you. God, maybe for the first time in a long time, you would meet us in this place, that you would begin to do a work that only you can do so that only you would get the glory, that you would change us from the inside out. So God, now as we go to the communion table, I pray that you would remind us just what it means to be your sons and your daughters. What a precious gift we have in you. God, what a beautiful thing it is to live in your grace. Not that we would abuse it, but that we would live in it. We'd embrace it. So God, we love you. Thank you for your word. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.